Thank you very much. So I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me here to this wonderful place uh, for the second time. And uh, great to be here, see some old friends, make some new friends. So uh, I guess the talk is 35 minutes long, but I think I'll finish ahead of time because uh, I found that uh, Ashwin had basically done all of the work in his Chandrasekhar lectures. And the first two thirds of my talk is, uh, has been covered by Ashwin. <laughs> but uh, one of my colleagues told me that uh, educating students is like, a, is like painting, painting a wall. You know, the more coats of paint, the better. So in that spirit, I will uh, maybe review some of those things that you've already learned from Ashwin. And then we'll go on to the new stuff. OK, so there's the outline of my talk. So the first, this part of it is, is basically just review, the first half of it. And please stop me at any time with questions. You don't have to wait till the end. OK. So what's a wild semi-metal? So imagine that there are two bands in a three-dimensional number one zone, and they touch at a point. And you ask yourself if these are the only two bands that are important, and, uh, uh, and you can neglect all other bands, then what is the band structure that follows from the fact that these two just touch at that one point? So you do something called k dot p perturbation theory. You expand around that point where they touch. And you find generically that this is the Hamiltonian because there are only two bands. There should be a two by two matrix in k space. And this is what that two by two matrix looks like generically. And then this guy is just the, 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 the unit matrix. So we can ignore it. So these guys are generically all linearly independent unless there are some symmetries that, that constrain some of them to be equal. So such a, a touching in the Brillouin zone is called a wild point. Okay, and K0 is a wild point. Now, one of the properties of these wild points is that in the Brillouin zone, in the three-dimensional Brillouin zone, it actually acts like a source of Berry flux. And to determine whether it's a source or a sink of Berry flux, you look at this object here, the sign of the coefficient of sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3 in this way. And that tells you the sign of the charge of the monopole that's either a source or a sink of this very flux. OK? Just yeah. Right. Yes. OK. So now, one of the things about three dimensional, about the Brillouin zone is that everything has to be periodic because k plus a reciprocal lattice vector is the same as k. So that tells you that the total monopole charge inside the Brillouin zone has to be zero. And that tells you that if you have a plus monopole somewhere, there has to be a corresponding minus monopole somewhere else. So these monopoles, or these wild points, have to come in plus minus pairs. Okay. All right. So now let's talk a little bit about symmetries. If both time reversal and inversion are present simultaneously in the three-dimensional band structure, then you can show that plus and minus charged monopoles have to sit at the same point. If you have no other symmetries, then usually you can add terms to the Hamiltonian that can gap out this Dirac point. That would be a Dirac point, and you can usually gap it out by adding mass terms, unless there are some other symmetries present. There are certain materials where there are Dirac points, and there are Dirac semi-metals, and because of the symmetry, you can't add those other mass terms. But generically speaking, if time reversal and inversion are the only two symmetries you're talking about, then you, sh you can gap them out. So typically, you will need either to break time reversal or to break inversion in order to create a wild semi-metal. And there are, those are the two different kinds of wild semi-metals. So uh, in fact, the very first wild semi-metal was the one that was inversion broken and time reversal symmetric. And that was discovered in this paper. And then the, the one that was the opposite, time reversal broken, inversion symmetric, was discovered by Ashwin and, and collaborators in, in 2011. And they further pointed out that there were these very important topologically protected surface states, which are the surface Fermi arcs. And they'll play a very important role in this, uh, the, the, the work that I'm going to describe. All right. Now let's go to the surface Fermi arcs. So now this is, again, a, a picture of the Brillouin zone. Yeah. Yes. 
So um, again, here's a picture of the Bilbon zone. And uh, these are the two wild points. Here's the plus monopole, here's the minus monopole. And that is the projections, those are the projections onto the surface Brillouin zone. So imagine that you have a slab, a semi-infinite slab of this wild semi-metal, and it's extended in the z direction from z equals zero to let's say minus infinity, and then in the x and the y directions it's completely infinite. So there are, there's translation symmetry in the x and the y directions. So kx and ky will be good quantum numbers. But kz, of course, is not, because you don't have translation symmetry in the z direction. So you'll have to think about the band structure on the surface Brillouin zone, just kx and ky. So you can ask yourself, what does that band structure look like? And here's a picture of what that band structure looks like. So of course, if you go to the Fermi, to, to the projections of the wild points, then there will be zero energy states there, because there are such states in the bulk. And um, basically, as you go up in energy, right, there's going to be a filled Fermi ball of states that are allowed just because of the bulk. Okay, those are the projections of the K of those bulk states onto the surface Brillouin zone. They'll be allowed. In addition, what Ashwin and collaborators pointed out was that in addition to those, the projections of those bulk states onto the surface Brillouin zone, there's also an additional state or, or additional sets of states and these are the Fermi arc states. Okay, these are the states that go in between the projections of the two while nodes onto the surface Brillouin zone. And of course, there could be more than two. In fact, in the case of uh, time reversal symmetric while semi-metals, there have to be at least four. But in the case of time reversal broken ones, you can get away with just two. Two is the minimal number. Okay, so we are going to stick with just the simplest possible case of just two while nodes time reversal broken, while semi-metal, and then there will be just one Fermi arc, okay? Now, presumably, Ashwin told you why there has to be a Fermi arc and so on and so forth. Is that right? <laughs> okay. Vaskin is doing everyone a huge service here. <laughs> so, okay, so let's go back here. Okay, so uh, I have to draw this out with my hands here. So imagine that you, you take a plane that is sort of the, in, the, in the YZ, something that's parallel to the KY, KZ plane, and you cut the Brillouin zone to the right of this blue point here. Okay? And uh, so that describes, that particular two-dimensional Brillouin zone describes a possible two-dimensional system. That two-dimensional system has some churn number. Okay? Let's call that C1, okay? whatever, whatever that churn number is. Now imagine taking that same KYKZ plane, something parallel to it, and moving it across this first while node, okay? Now, because this is a source of monopole flux, that tells you that the churn number must have changed by plus one as it crosses this monopole, okay? So here, the churn number, so imagine for a second, the simplest case, when the churn number outside these two, the projections of these two while nodes was zero. When it comes in here, it is one. And then as it moves, again, it's going to cross this red while node, and then it's going to drop back to zero. Okay, so there's a region of Kx where these effective two-dimensional systems have a churn number of one. And then so it's, it starts from zero, and as you cross the first while node, it becomes one. And then you cross the second while node, it drops back to zero. Okay, so each of these hypothetical two-dimensional systems, because they have a churn number of one, they will have basically quantum Hall chiral edge modes. Okay? It's the combination of those edge modes that really forms the Fermi arc. Okay? And this Fermi arc is chiral in a similar way as the quantum Hall states are chiral. It disperses only in one direction. Okay? The velocity is perpendicular to the, the Fermi arc. It goes points in only one direction. Okay. All right, so um, to focus our thinking, I'm going to consider an extremely simple model, as I said, which is time reversal broken. It has only two while nodes, and uh, it has a single Fermi arc on the surface. And this model is particularly simple, so you can actually write it down in this way on a lattice, okay, so you can see the periodicity of the, of the case. 
and that tells you that you're on a lattice. So there's a lattice model, and that'll prove helpful because you can do certain kinds of calculations on lattice models that you cannot do in continuum models. OK. So you can sort of by inspection, oops, sorry, wrong button. You can see by inspection that the while points will be whenever all the coefficients of these things are simultaneously 0. And that tells you that kx, ky, and kz should be 0 or pi. And this particular combination here tells you that, that ky and kz have to actually be 0, because then these two guys, cosine ky and cosine kz, cancel the 2. And then the kx will cancel, cosine kx will cancel cosine k0 at plus or minus k0. Okay, very simple model. And uh, those are the wild points of that simple model. And in this model, you can actually you know, go to real space in the z direction. Here's what the real space Hamiltonian looks like. Okay, you keep k, k, y, and k, sorry, kx and ky as parameters of your Hamiltonian. You get a one-dimensional chain, and you can find the edge states of that chain. Okay. So for this particularly simple model, it turns out that the Fermi arcs are actually just straight lines. They, at, the, at zero energy, they will just connect the projections of the two wild loads. On the top surface, the, the velocity is downwards. On the bottom surface, the velocity is upwards. There's also a particular spin projection associated with it, the Fermi arc states. Okay, but I'm not, I'm not mentioning that here. But these kind of go together. On the one surface is one projection. On the other surface is the opposite projection of spin. OK, so this is what the, what the general picture looks like. All right, now in the past four or five years, lots and lots of wild semi-metals have been discovered. So the first to be discovered already in 2015 and so on were uh, the ones of the first type, where time reversal was preserved, but inversion was broken. And, and these are the tantalum arsenide and niobium arsenide and so on. And those are here listed in red. And then very, very recently, just this year, uh, people have discovered two different, uh, or three different, uh, maybe just two, two different uh, magnetic wild semi-metals, things where time reversal symmetry is broken, but inversion symmetry is preserved. So these are some complicated magnets. This particular one, it turns out, actually has three pairs of wild nodes in the three-dimensional number one zone. So instead of one, which is the minimal number of pairs in a time reversal broken wild semi-metal, this guy has three. Okay. All right. Now, how do you detect these guys? How do you detect the fact that there are these special topologically protected surface states? So here's a little cartoon. So in this case, in this particular diagram, the x and the y directions are actually in k space, and the z direction is in real space. Okay. So keep that in mind. So this, these are the projections of the two while nodes onto the surface per one zone. And on the surface, I've generically put some curved Fermi arc. And now let's imagine that you put a perpendicular magnetic field as well, pointing in the z direction. So what happens on the Fermi arcs is actually pretty clear, because the velocity is always perpendicular to the Fermi arcs. So there's going to be some kind of Lorentz force on it. So you can easily write down some semi-classical equation. Ek dt is q times v cross b, and the v will be just de dk, is the group velocity of that dispersion. And so what's going to happen is the wave packet is going to basically slide along the Fermi arc from one of these projections to the other projection. Now the question is, what happens when it gets to one of these projections of the bulk while nodes? So there you have to actually go into the bulk, and you have to look at the band structure of the bulk in the presence of a magnetic field. So I have plotted only one of the while nodes here. What happens is that it has the usual kind of gapped Dirac band structure, except for one chiral Landau level. And this is the dispersion with Kz. Okay, so this is Kz, and that is energy. And you can see that this particular n equals 0 Landau level actually has a velocity in the z direction. So it has a dE by dKz, so it actually moves in the z direction. And so the picture, the cartoon picture, is that basically at one of the while nodes, it moves up, and the other while node, it moves down. So imagine the same picture with this guy just reflected. Okay, that'd be the other while node. And so that's how the wave packet gets from one 
surface of this slab to the other surface. Okay? And so there are a lot of different things you can do with this, and there are a number of different signatures that you can construct by setting up various different experimental setups, just having this picture in mind. It drifts along the Fermi arc on the surfaces, but in the bulk, it uses this bulk chiral mode to actually travel between the two surfaces. Okay, so that's the, that's the basic idea of how to detect these surface Fermi arcs. Okay. All right, so that's pretty much what I'm going to say as a review of what Ashwin told you about wild semi-metals and, and, and surface states, Fermi arcs. And then I'm going to turn to the next thing that Ashwin told you about, which is the Moray story in uh, bilayer graphene. And so this was made famous by Bistritz and McDonald in this paper here. And uh, so the idea is the following. So you, you take two two-dimensional systems, which are perfect crystals, and you twist them by some very small and arbitrary angle, and you put them into tunnel contact. And you ask yourself, what is the resulting, what is the, what is the physics of this resulting composite system? Okay? So here's a pictorial representation. This is the bottom, so the B stands for the bottom, the T stands for the top, and then you have these two different sets of reciprocal lattice vectors. And the question is, what does the tunneling between the two layers, what does it do to the K, okay, the, 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 the conserved K in each layer, what happens to it? All right, so let's take a sort of a, a, a generic point of view here. So let's imagine that this is some tunneling operator here, and this is KT and alpha. KT is the momentum of the electron in the top layer. Alpha is its band index, and similarly KB is the momentum of the electron in the bottom layer, and beta is its, its band index. And you can ask yourself what that thing would look like. Okay. So again, complete generality, you can, you can write down something like this. You can always write down the, the, the state as some periodic block function times e to the i k dot r. And here's some tunneling operator between them. And so the, the, the question is really, what is the form of this tunneling operator? So there are two assumptions that go into the, the formulation of this Moray, Brillouin zone, and Bistritz and McDonald. The first assumption is that this tunneling is really a function only of the difference of the two coordinates there, okay? So this one and that one. Okay, that is the first assumption. If you make that assumption, something very simplifying happens. So you can see that just conservation of momentum integrating over R and R prime over here, it tells you something like this. So it gives you a condition, it gives you a relation between the two wave vectors, K top and K bottom, okay? So nothing mysterious has happened. I've just used basically some delta functions, okay? All right, then, so, <coughs> now you can write down some effective reciprocal lattice vectors, which I'm calling the small g's, which are the differences of the big g's, and this is g1, for example, and that is g2, for example, and uh, this sort of looks like what is happening here is that basically, the B and the T can differ by any of the reciprocal lattice vectors, which are small, right? The, the moiré reciprocal lattice vectors, which are represented by these small Gs, okay? So that's what it looks like. This works for a while, okay? So, but then eventually, if you're hopping, sorry, sorry. If you're hopping has matrix elements for very large values of Q, then this breaks down. And you, you start noticing the fact that this is actually not a periodic system, there's something incommensurate about this system. So the second assumption that goes into Bishop's and McDonald is that this T of Q should die off sufficiently rapidly as a function of this magnitude. Okay? So given those two assumptions, then this entire system has some effective large unit cell, which is the Moray unit cell, and an effective Moray set of reciprocal lattice vectors. Okay? So that is the Bishop's and McDonald story. All right, so what do we have so far? So these are the two things that we're gonna to put together and uh, make up our, our whatever, whatever it is that we are doing. All right, so this is the review of the wild semi-metals. They have gapless points in their three-dimensional Bilbao zone, and then the, the free surfaces have these Fermi arcs which connect the, the projections of the wild points onto the surface Bilbao zone. Great, 
and this is the Bishop's and McDonald's story, under certain well-defined assumptions, there is an effective periodicity to the Moray periodicity. Okay? Now we're going to put these two things together. So what we're going to do is we're going to take two pieces of wild semi-metal, you're going to twist them with respect to each other, and we're going to put them back down together, tunnel couple them, and ask what happens to these surface states? How do they reconstruct? Okay, when you when you tunnel couple them. And there, there are lots of motivations. We basically did it because it was fun, but we also wanted to have states that are completely independent of the bulk, that are purely at the surface, and maybe we could manipulate them, we could tune them, we could do all kinds of things with them which would be independent of the bulk thickness, bulk disorder, all other stuff. Okay, so let's do a little warm up. Okay, so let's imagine that I take the same the one, one infinite piece of wild semi-metal, I cut it into two pieces, and I just twist by 90 degrees and I put it back down. Okay, so what would it look like? Well, this is what it would look like. So the bottom would have a plus and a minus on the surface build one zone. The top would also have a plus and a minus on the surface per one zone, and the two Fermi arcs would cross in this way. Okay? The little black arrows that I'm showing here, the little black and the little blue arrows, tell you the direction of the velocity. Okay? The velocity is always perpendicular to the Fermi arc. Okay, if I tunnel couple them, it's very simple. So all that happens is that here's the top, here's the bottom, that's the dispersion of it, and then here's the coupling between them. It's very obvious what happens, right? Basically, there's going to be level repulsion wherever they cross, and it's going to, the crossing is going to become an avoided crossing. Okay, that's pretty much it. All right, very simple. And here, so this is the advantage of having an explicit lattice representation, is that in this case, you could basically tell generically what was going to happen, but in the lattice, if you actually put the two things down at 90 degrees, you can actually tunnel couple them, you can compute everything. Okay? You can compute everything explicitly, and the states look as follows. So this kappa here is the coupling, the strength of the tunnel coupling in some dimensionless units uh, between the two surfaces, right? And you can see that for weak coupling, it does exactly what you expect, and then as you increase the strength of the coupling, it kind of has more and more and more level of portion. Okay? And one of the features of this is that the plus point is always connected to the plus point, and the minus point is always connected to the minus point. So basically what's going to happen is that this plus green is going to be connected to the plus blue, and that guy is going to be connected to that, okay, under the reconstruction. So that's sort of the simplest Fermi arc reconstruction you can have. All right. Now what we're going to do is to construct more general ones, we're going to go to, yeah. Okay, excellent. So I, we were a little, little, little puzzled by this as well. But think about it in the following limit. I can give you a, a sort of a cartoon, a hand-waving answer. So imagine that I make the angle really, really small, and I put the plus on top of the plus, right? That means that the, the entire slab is now just one slab, and there's no need for any surface states. So all the states should just disappear. So they should just cancel out. If the plus is connected to the plus, then you can see that the, as I make that angle really tiny and it tends to zero, the surface states just disappear. No, because it forms just one bulk, right? It's just a single bulk now. So that interface at zero angle, right, this intermediate surface is just an illusory surface, right? It's not a real surface. It, it comes back to the, it becomes a part of the bulk, so there's, there's no surface state. So in fact, it always has to be that the plus connects to the plus, because that limit can always be taken. Okay? And besides, so another way of thinking about it, more, more pedestrian, is the following. So the energy is increasing in this direction, right? So you can actually see that whatever this delta is, the energy is going to be, you know, basically the, the, the difference between these two mod square minus the difference between these two more square, right? And so you can actually tell that it always curves in the direction in which the, the, the velocity sort of is always positive or always negative. So that's a more mechanistic way of thinking about it. Okay? 
All right. So what we're going to do in general now, in some kind of continuum formulation, is to uh, take the original surface bevel 1 zone and just zone fold it. Because we know that this relation holds always. So we just zone fold the, both the Fermi arcs into this tiny moiré Bruin zone. And then wherever they intersect in this tiny moiré Bruin zone, we're going to replace crossings by avoided crossings. Okay, so it's, it's going to be as simple as that. Okay? There are certain conditions for this to be true, and we can get into it. If somebody wants to know, I can, I can tell them. But uh, basically, what it means is that in Bistritz and McDonald, it's actually very helpful if the tunneling decays very rapidly with Q. Okay? Whereas in our case, we actually want it to not decay too rapidly with Q. So we want the, the tunneling in real space to be fairly short range. But of course, not short range enough to violate the, the, the periodicity of the more able one. So I, I, I can tell you if you, if you really want to know. Okay. Yeah. You mean at, at theta equals pi? OK, so at theta equals pi, so let's go back over there. So theta equals pi, what's going to happen is that this is going to be sitting on top of that, and there are going to be two different Fermi arcs. And they will, of course, level repel, right? And so they will kind of bow out. Okay, uh, I wish I'd made a picture of that. That's actually a good point, OK? So but we have done that calculation as well, and it, and it bows out. Okay, but there will be two different Fermi arcs there. OK, so let's think about twist angles near theta equals 0. I think I'm running pretty short of time. So uh, this is what the, the, the unreconstructed Fermi arcs would look like. And this is what the Moray folded unreconstructed Fermi arcs look like. So I've now folded them into the Moray one zone. OK, so that's what this little g here is representing. So this is really minus pi over 2 to plus pi over 2 in the Moray one zone. Okay? So those are the intersections after zone folding. And now what you do is you just replace every crossing by an avoided crossing. And if you pay attention to what the directions of the velocities are and so on, you will find this. Once again, the plus is connected to the plus. The minus is connected to the minus. There's some, you know, snaky path that goes between them. But regardless, it looks pretty much the same as, you know, two guys at 90 degrees to each other. It's just that the, the actual path of this Fermi arc in the Bruin zone is different. Okay, but the physics is all the same as that of the unreconstructed Fermi arcs. Okay? So they all always have to go through the bulk, because all the Fermi arcs that you see over here actually go to the projections of the wild points. Okay? All right. So now let's think about twist angles near pi by 2. And this is where things get interesting. So let me give you a generic scenario here. OK, so some small twist angle near pi by 2. This is the unreconstructed Fermi arcs. And these are the reconstructed Fermi arcs. OK, so now you see there's something different has happened. So there are two Fermi arcs. This is what I call 1 and 2. These guys do go through the projections of the wild points. But then there are some others, which I call 3 and 4. So this is, of course, the same point as that. And they form an interesting shape. They actually wind around both of the wave vectors of this fundamental more able one zone. Okay, so they're kind of winding around both the holes of the torus. Okay, so you cannot deform these guys into a point. Okay? And also, they have nothing whatsoever to do with the bulk. So they're completely surface states. Okay, so this is the kind of situation where we can achieve states which lie entirely on the surface, disconnected from the bulk. And now you can start thinking about how to detect these, how to manipulate them, and so on. But one other interesting thing before we go there, which is that, uh, OK, so, so here it is. OK, I've, I've written down various things. There are two of them that always go through the bulk. And then there are other closed Fermi loops. And these Fermi loops, if you look at the directions of the velocities, they will always be in such a way that the orbit that is represented by these Fermi arcs, in real space, it will never be closed. Okay, so they represent open orbits in real space. Even though they are closed in momentum space, 
If you look at the velocities, they're always open in real space. Okay? They will not form loops in real space. So that means, of course, that when you put a perpendicular magnetic field on them, there won't be things like de Haas van Alphen effect, Kubnikov de Haas, things like that will not occur because you, they don't enclose any flux. Okay? All right. One other interesting possibility. Yeah. Sorry, Adi, can't hear you. Speak up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll just keep going. Right? So it will go on, on a side. It'll go to the edge of the other edge of the surface and go into some other surface state over there. OK. Now, one interesting idea, one interesting possibility is that what happens if your angle is such that the, when upon folding into the more able one zone, the two pluses sit exactly on top of each other. What happens then? Okay. So these are the, the, the angles that we call arcless angles. Okay. So here's an example of an arcless angle when there is no tunnel coupling between the two surfaces. And here's what happens when there is tunnel coupling. Okay. You say, okay, so what? Really, I mean, there's still this one and the two that are going through the bulk while node, and so it'll be pretty much the same as what happens in the unreconstructed one. It turns out there's a, there's a bit of a surprise here. It turns out that if you make the coupling between the two surfaces strong enough, then, so I'm going to show you something here. So here's again a lattice calculation, and I've taken that case where theta is equal to pi. Somebody asked me about theta equals pi. So I do have a picture, right? And here's the picture, okay? So this, is, is basically one of the, the projections of the wild points, and this is the other one. And what happens is that there are two Fermi arcs. They repel each other, as you can see. But as you increase the strength of the tunnel coupling, these Fermi arcs can actually detach themselves from the, from the wild points, and they can form these closed loops here. Okay? You can have a situation where things are completely detached from the projections of the bulk while points. Okay? And in that case, in that case, you will have all the surface states being completely unconnected to the bulk. Okay? And that's, I think, a pretty interesting case. Yes and no. So there's quantum oscillations of, of different kinds. Okay? One quantum oscillation which they will exhibit, which these states will also exhibit, is that because they are finite, they're closed in K space, okay? And if you, if you do some semi-classical quantization of these guys, they will form discrete energy levels, okay? But the problem is that they will, form, they will go along equipotentials, right? Along equal energy contours. So this, each particular contour will give you a set of equally spaced levels, but the next one will be slightly different in energy, slightly different energy, and so on. Okay, so that overall, there is no quantization of energy. Okay? But you can detect them by, by uh, basically optical conductivity. If you take a microwave and send it in, it will get absorbed at certain frequencies, which are these frequencies. You can also have magnetic breakdown, absolutely. So maybe I should just, uh, just skip, to the, skip to the end because I'm, I'm out. Okay, so here are the conclusions. Okay, blah, 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 and blah, and then... Here are the open questions, and, and let me limit here. That's right, magnetic breakdown can happen. There's something we haven't thought about is the effect of surface disorder. And then instead of having two wild semi-metals on top of each other, you can have a wild and a sheet of graphene or, or various other interesting combinations. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Professor Murthy. Any questions, comments? Adi. Adi, you don't need a microphone. Come on. I never thought I would have to ask you to speak up. You surprised me. You asked me to speak <laughs> up. No one ever does. <laughs> so I'm, I'm confused about these uh, uh, open orbits. Yeah. Uh, 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 you're saying in K space they are closed? Closed loops in K space. In real space they're open? Uh, in real space they're open, yeah. Usually uh, the equations of motion tell, tells us that... Uh, uh, that the velocity in real space is uh, perpendicular to k dot. 
That's correct. So, so and, and that would imply that uh, if one is closed, the other is closed as well. Uh, so, so what uh, makes No, this that's, that's not quite valid. true, right? Because if you, well, OK, so the, the, I think the point is that it's going across a Bilwan zone. So if you take a very simple two-dimensional structure, right, a two-dimensional lattice, which is very anisotropic in its hopping, the Fermi surface may look something like this. Right? And then the velocity here will always be like that, right? And then if you put a perpendicular magnetic field, it'll drift along here and it'll form something closed in, in, in K space, but it won't be closed in real space. Oh, okay. It's of that type. Oh, okay, I would call but it's this chiral. Uh, of course, uh, here there are two of them, but there it's chiral. Uh, uh, I would call this open in K space because in an extended zone. Okay, okay, okay. okay, fine, okay. okay. In an extended zone scheme, there it's open, yeah. but I'm counting K plus G as K. Sorry? No. Oh, yeah, actually, they were. Uh, no, 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 no. They weren't. No. So, what happened was that um, my orbits went sort of like this and like that and like that and like that. They're open. Yeah. In an extended scheme, they're open. Yeah. Any further questions? But if I do bohr sommerfeld quantization, of course, I have to bring back the k plus g to k, right? So I have to consider it as closed. Maybe. Yeah. On what the tunnel coupling is, yeah. is it possible then that these States are also coupled to each other if the tunnel coupling falls off very quickly with, with yes. Q. Yes. So what will happen is that, so I, I cheated you a little bit, OK? So I lied to you a little bit. Uh, where do I go? OK, great. So the answer to your question is this. What I have done here, the way I have lied to you, is that I have assumed that all these gaps are the same. But of course, they're not the same, right? I mean, uh, it depends upon how many foldings, how many G foldings I've, I've taken. So the higher the G folding, the smaller will be this gap. And so that's where the magnetic breakdown will happen first. OK? And if it falls off exponentially, then there are certain of these guys which won't be gapped at all, or they won't be perceptible. And then it'll just go straight through. There's some lifetime of the electron in each of these states, so to, so to speak. Yeah, you can think about it that way, yeah. Okay, since we are running short of time, maybe we can move it to the breaks. Let us thank Prof. Samurthy once again. Thank you.